Will you give witness to your faith this morning by standing for the reading of the gospel? It will be followed by the doxology that is printed in your bulletin. From the Gospel of Luke. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will will be exalted. So you really have to listen carefully. In fact, I would even say you may have to strain your ears to hear because the cry for mercy comes from one who the Bible says here was afar off. It's, it's a distant cry. Strain your ears and see if you can hear the cry. Now, one of the reasons we have to listen very intently to hear that cry for mercy is because it's being drowned out by a boisterous, presumptuous, bragging, religious loudmouth in Jesus' story. And because there's still plenty of those around today, we have to listen carefully to hear that distant cry. Because Jesus says in the parable that it was the prayer of that prayer, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, that led him home. That is, it led him to a strong, right relationship with God. That's home because that's where we belong and that's where God desires for us to be. So what is the nature of this cry that leads us to that place of relationship with God, the cry that leads us home? Well, first of all, it was an honest cry. It was an honest cry. This tax collector that stood afar off and asked for mercy, he was aware of himself because he was aware of his faults. He was aware of his failures. He was aware of where he had fallen. He was acutely aware of his status as sinner. No pretension there. No bragging. No trying to put on a different air or a different face. No, it was an honest cry. And friends, this is where it begins. Honesty before the Lord. Lord, I know my sin. I know my brokenness. I know my faults. Here I am crying for your mercy. That's where it starts for all of us. I read one author and he said that in the Gospels, Jesus was constantly, constantly contending with the fault finders, the sidewinders, and the vision blinders. I like that. The fault finders, the sidewinders, and the vision blinders. You know, the fault finders, those who trusted in themselves, because you see, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, self-justification and the judgment of others go together. And so the fault finders, those are the finger pointers. Then you get the sidewinders, they're the ones looking for the angle. Hey, there's a little angle here. Hey, maybe I can just get enough to get by. And then you have the vision blinders, those who, the kingdom of God, they can't see the kingdom of God even though he's standing right in front of them. But the author goes on to say, in every case, regardless, one of the challenges that Jesus put forth, which is also in this parable, is a challenge to be honest before the Lord. A challenge to honesty and integrity before the very one who created you. This is the cry that leads us home. Now, kind of like the Pharisee in the parable, even though we wouldn't say it out loud, I still think sometimes in the back of our minds, in the back of our hearts, we, we see a parable like this, and we know, yes, I'm a sinner, I need mercy, but maybe our prayer goes something like this in private or even unspoken. Lord, I know I need your mercy. Lord, I know I'm a sinner, but boy, I'm glad I'm not like that guy over there. And Lord, at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. And Lord, I don't indulge myself in this. And so in the back of our minds sometimes, we're still considering ourselves just a bit better than someone else. 
And friends, that's not honest before the Lord. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means you and me. So the, the distant cry that leads us home begins with honesty before the Lord. An honest cry. Secondly, it was a humble cry. Jesus says, the one, the one who is humbled will be exalted. This tax collector couldn't even look up to heaven. He stood far away. That was humility. It's interesting in the parable, I hope you picked up on that, you know, it's, it's total in, the opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of the characters, right? The Pharisee is the religious expert, the religious professional, you know, the one who is majored in all things God. <laughs> and then on the other hand, we have the tax collector who was considered probably one of the most despicable characters of that day. Yet he is the one who went down to his house justified. That is, he's the one who came into a right relationship with God. Why? Because he humbled himself. He humbled himself and cried out to the Lord. And friends, we need to be humbled and to be humble. There will be humbling moments in life. I believe instead of being embarrassed or ashamed, we should just be thankful that God chooses us along the way, chooses to humble us. You know, I'm a big Miami Dolphins fan. I didn't think I'd get any amens, in, but that's the, I, did, I didn't expect it. As a result of that, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the legendary coach, Don Shula. A number of years ago, Shula tells the story of when his kids, he had five children, by the way, he said, we needed to get out of the hustle and bustle of Miami, so for summer vacation, I rented a cabin up in Maine. He said, we went up to this wilderness cabin just to get away from it all. And he said, but it only took a couple of days till my young kids were completely stir-crazy. Dad, why did you bring us out here? So he said one evening, there was a little town nearby, so he said to him, I'll tell you what, we'll drive into town and go to the movies. So they went into this little town, the little theater there downtown, and he said, we walked in, he goes, as we walk in, there's just a few people there, and he said, they look back, and they see me, and they applaud. And Shula says, I acknowledge their applause, thank you, thank you very much, and we sat quietly down, and we watched the movie. And uh, for you who are younger, back in the old days, in the old movie houses, a lot of times the manager, the owner, actually greeted you, while you when you left the movie theater. That was a thing. And so Shula says, we're walking out, and I said to the manager, uh, you know, I didn't even know they knew who I was up here. And the manager said, sir, I don't know who you are either. He said, but I only show the movie if there's ten people present, and there were only three, and your family of seven made ten, so they were happy to see you. Shula says it was truly one of the most humbling moments of his life. <laughs> Thinking you're somebody and then being humbled. All of us have those humbling moments in life. And again, we should thank the Lord for them. Because they should be reminders to us that always, always, we need to make that humble plea before the Lord. Coming before his throne, remember Jesus himself, Paul says, humbled himself and became obedient, even to death on the cross. So I cannot see how any of us could stand before the cross of the one who gave himself entirely for us and do anything but hit our knees and cry out in humility, be merciful to me. Lord, be merciful to me. Third, it was a heartfelt cry. A heartfelt cry. You can see or feel the intensity of the tax collector's prayer. If you read it over and over, you can hear him crying out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It obviously came from the very depths of his being, this prayer, this cry that led him home. And the cry that leads us home, brothers and sisters, has to come from the depths of our heart. You know, we have to mean it, but that almost sounds too shallow. We have to mean it from the depths of who we are when we cry out for God's mercy. That's the cry that leads to a right relationship with God. That's the cry that leads us home. The reason I say that is I sometimes wonder, I wonder if, if it's difficult for us to genuinely cry out from our hearts because our hearts are so encumbered with other things these days. You heard it in the song. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there's where your heart will be. 
So if my heart is encumbered with all of these treasures of, of humanity in the world, if my heart is encumbered with possessions and, and agendas and success and this and that and all of these things are binding up my heart, how could I ever openly and authentically offer my heart to God when I know it's already encumbered with all of these other things? I, I re, you know, I'm sure you've read two of the wagon trains that made their way westward. And people would pack those covered wagons just full of their possessions. But as they went along and the storms came and the, the roads became rugged and all sorts of things happened, they say that along those westward trails there was possessions littered all over the place. Because people had to lighten their load. They realized we're not going to make the journey if we try to take all of this stuff with us. And so there's all sorts of things just laying by the side. They had to give those up if they were going to continue the journey. And friends, when it comes to a journey that leads us home, a journey that leads us into a right relationship with God, we have to unencumber our hearts by offering all to the Lord, giving that up so that we can cry to Him with the bottom of our hearts. And make no mistake, God knows the difference between a half-hearted cry and a heartfelt cry. We know this. You, you know, parents or others, you, you've, you know, you've been to the shopping mall or the grocery store and you hear a kid cry. You know, my, myself, I, you learn the difference between the cries. You know, there's sort of the attention-getting cry, not real. It's sort of the protesting cry, not real. It's sort of the, I want to be in charge of this decision, not you cry, not real. Uh, somebody should write a book on all the different little cries from an infant or toddler, right? Because we know the difference. But we also know when the cry is one of true hurt and true pain and true brokenness, we know that cry. And so if we know that, being human, our Lord knows. He knows what constitutes a heartfelt cry. And so we unencumber our hearts, get rid of all of these things. You say, well, I'll preach it now, wait just a second there. You know, I, I live in a culture and a society, I can say anything I want. I'm free to speak anything I want. Yes, you are. That's true in our culture. The question is, is the speech appropriate for the kingdom of God? You see, friends, we answer to a different allegiance than our society in general. They say, well, I can, have, I can hold any opinion I want it. Yes, you can. But I ask you, is that opinion appropriate for the kingdom of God? I can do whatever I want. I'm free. Thank goodness I'm free. I can just go and do it. Yes, you can. But are those actions appropriate for the kingdom of God? As kingdom people, we have a different allegiance. And so when we cry from the bottom of our heart, we have to make sure that we are crying to the one that we know we are aligned toward. It's that heartfelt cry that leads us home that leads us to a right relationship with God. Finally, it's a hope-filled cry. The tax collector must have heard from someone that God is a God of mercy, yes? Because why would he have asked God for mercy if he hadn't already heard that God is a merciful God? Sometimes people have said, you know, what do you think comes first, repentance or forgiveness? And of course, as humans, we want to say, well, repentance, because, you know, you have to be really sorry if you're going to be forgiven. But, but, but wait a second. It's only because we know that God is a forgiving God that we're crying out to him to start with. It's only because we've already heard he's going to forgive. He's a God of mercy. Therefore, my cry becomes filled with hope because it's directed to the Lord who will always forgive when he hears that cry. That's the hope-filled nature of the cry of this tax collector. That's the hope-filled nature of the cry that leads us home. I had a colleague tell the story of an elderly lady in his uh, church, and she told about she lived in a tower of apartments, and she said one day she had fallen. She was afraid she was injured. She wasn't able to get to the phone. She wasn't able to really move much. But she remembered that her neighbor always came out to get the newspaper at a, at a certain time window. So she waited for that time window to arrive and she started calling out for help. And she continued to call out for help. And she continued to call out for help. And finally, sure enough, the neighbor had come out to pick up her newspaper and heard her cry and offered aid and got her help. But they asked the lady, 
you must have called out for a long time. How long? She said, oh, probably half an hour or more. Why did, why did you not give up? Why did you keep calling? And she said, because I knew my friend, I knew when she heard that she would come. I knew when she heard that she would come. Friends, the reason I can cry out to my Lord is because I know he hears my cry for mercy. And he will respond. So my heart is filled with hope as I cry out. Because this is our God who's responding to us. Friends, yes, sometimes even today, we may have to strain our ears to hear the cry because there is a lot of boisterous, presumptuous, religious noise that fills our culture. But ultimately, it is the honest cry and the humble cry. It's the heartfelt cry and the hope-filled cry that leads us to a right relationship with God. It's the cry that leads us home. Let us pray. Lord God, you know us better than we know ourselves. Our sin, our faults, our failings, our tendency towards being self-righteous or presumptuous. But today, we stand before the cross of your Son, the one who gave everything for us. And so God, our prayer, Lord God, be merciful to us sinners. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.